recording. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. David Vassar Taylor. I am the Vice President for Programs for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. We are here today as part of the Veterans History Project uh, interviewing uh, Mr. James Lucas. Uh, this project is under the auspices of the Atlanta History Center and is part of a larger national program to capture the remembrances of our veteran soldiers uh, in the many theaters of war uh, that we have been in. Uh, today is November 3rd, um, 2017, and uh, we will begin the interviewing process with our guest today, uh, Mr. James Lucas. For the record, uh, Mr. Lucas, would you uh, state your full name uh, and uh, where you reside? Well, my full name is James Lucas, called Jack, of course, and my resident right now is Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I have a post office box in Riverdale, Georgia. Thank you, sir. And uh, what is the date of your birth, and where were you born? I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, January the 16th, 1933. Mm -hmm. And your parents were? James Arthur Lucas Sr. and Lula Smith Lucas, that was my mother. Okay. And were you born in a rural or urban environment? I was born in an urban environment, but I was born at home because where I lived, they didn't have hospital facilities that would accommodate my parents at that time. So um, most children during this time in Winston-Salem were born at home, and I was no exception to that. And what was your parents' occupation? They both, at the time I was born, were working for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, which was the most popular manufacturing thing, their cigarettes tobacco and <clears throat> they both worked. Uh, I know the tail folk I never had the luxury of mother and father seemed to be raised by two mules. Uh -huh. Both of them got up, another one put on harness to it, <laughs> went on out there and brought the bacon in together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Did you have any siblings, brothers or sisters? Oh yes, uh, they had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had five siblings. I had my older sister, Ada Virginia, we called her V. My older brother, Roger, we called him Jake. Then we had Wanda, and she's the starlet, you know. She, and then me, then Cliff, my baby brother, and then Mildred, the baby girl. It's just the two of us left now, Mildred and myself. Mm -hmm. So you were the Middle child, as it were. Well, four, I'm the fourth of six. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And uh, could you share with us uh, whatever educational background you, you had? Well, I've done fairly good in the education. <clears throat> Most of it is public school system in Western Salem, Versailles. Matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> Togo West Senior was my. When I was going to Atkins with my homeroom teacher, my coach for football, his son became Secretary of the Army, Togo West Jr., mm -hmm. and he also became Secretary of the VA, mm -hmm. Togo West Jr. did. And I was, uh, had, um, <clears throat> we were all in Atkins High School together, which was celebrated in Uncle High School in North Carolina at the time, 4A champions and this sort of thing. I had, um, this this uh, medical building here at Fort McPherson is named after Lawrence Joel. He was a year younger than me. He went to school with me. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but he also served a while with me in Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's quite a soldier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the influences on you in your early life? Well, <clears throat> I was fortunate, like I said earlier, I'm not a self-made man. I came through the Boy Scouts. My daddy made sure that I went into that. And 
he was Rob Stewart, scoutmaster, and Rob Stewart was mine. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a church thing. I, I um, came, I'm out of Shallow Baptist Church, and um, we had a celebrated minister at the time. We both went to Shallow at the same time. He came there to preach. I went there as a baby, and there was Dr. Pitts. And um, he's quite a revolutionary man. He was, he he made sure he well he done well. We all uh, he he made sure that we always looked up to each other and got things done. So this served you well. Oh as yes. You, uh, well, tell us a little bit how you got into the military then. From okay, my father was in World War One, mm -hmm. and my oldest brother was in World War Two. Mm -hmm. My dad was an infantryman. My oldest brother was a, was a medic. I'm the third of three of the males in, in the family to do this. So I'm not really unique. I'm not the hero of the family. I'm just another war, okay. okay. <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, and when I went in the military, I, they had adver advertisements right after World War II when I goes in and they had the signs up, join the Navy and see the world. Ain't no war, girl in every port and all that. I don't know what I'm gonna do with one in every port. I can't do it with one here at home, but <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was interesting to think, something to think about. So you know, I was lured, I guess that way. And I needed another adventure. I didn't know much other than Winston-Salem. I needed to get out to meet somebody else. How old were you then? I was 16 when I joined. But they were smart enough to not take me until the following year when I'm 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how, that's really how I got in. Then there was fellas in the neighborhood who had been in the military other than my brother and daddy. Uh, Billy Mays had been in the Navy. A few other guys had been in the Navy. And then they, the Navy was con in my neighborhood was considered a kind of elite service, so to speak. You had to make certain grades and this sort of thing to be in. They were, like I said, if you flunked out the Navy, you could always make it in the Army. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you inducted? Where did you begin your service? Well, your I uh, actually joined and went, I made the paperwork out in Winston-Salem, but I had to go to Raleigh to take the oath. Mm -hmm. That's where they shipped me to San Diego from. The only boot camp facilities available to the Navy at the time was San Diego. They had closed up uh, Great Lakes in Illinois. Mm -hmm. So, and I liked that too, cause I, got, I had an opportunity to take a bus ride all the way across the country. And I, I got to see areas of the United States I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, coming out of the South, going into the Navy, what was your feeling with respect to how you would be accepted as a person of color? That's very interesting. I like the question. Let's hope uh, my answer was sort of, I didn't think much about it at the time, really, I, but I thought it may be, I ran into some Jim Crow situations, of course, going across country. Uh, matter of fact, I ran across some at home. I had a very uncanny experience with my complexion, of course, uh, not being light enough to be white, not being dark enough to be black. So. I'm falling somewhere in between the cracks. I heard one black fella say, oh, you could almost pass for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Never did figure out what one of them was, but I, I got some idea. <laughs> and I think he was, he may have been right. I did at some time um, being offered positions that guys whose complexion were darker than mine hadn't been offered. Mm -hmm. And I think that they done it only because of my complexion. I, and I thought I lived up to that, uh, to that position 
well enough that they were willing to go and get some even darker and move them on in. You know, they had a name for guys like me, them first ones, you know. <laughs> so was there, uh, how was the military then situated after World War II and, and you're going into Korea here? Um, was it a, a fully integrated situation or did were blacks still relegated to the service sections of service or, I mean, what, what was the d dynamic? That's a very good question. I, I really like that one because you really hit the point. You hit, you hit the mark that time. They had desegregated the military, so to speak, two years before I go in, in 1948. Harry Truman, give him hell Harry, was president at the time. And, um, Men of the people who were in the military at the time didn't really adjust to it right off as well. They, uh, you know, you had those people who had always thought that with their complexion alone, it gave them some kind of a rule or thought over those whose complexion may have been a little dark and this sort of thing. And but now you, when you integrate it, you find out that some of those guys are. Moving on up to the top echelon, we get now we're sitting in the row for some Colin Powells and and some of these other things, and I like the idea that Colin Powell made a point of letting him know that he was standing on the shoulders of men who had gone before him that was willing to take the kind of punishment that we had to take to for men like that to to, to move on up, and uh, I, I like that, but uh, some of people forget. But that man didn't forget mm -hmm. that there were men, like I said, my brother said, now when he was in there, they had general, they had a general who was black. His name was Benjamin O. Davis. Mm -hmm. But he said he was he he was not inspirational to the black soldier. They said his his uh, conversation when he came on the on their posts uh, at their camps was, I'm your color, but I ain't your kind. You know, that's that's no way to talk to a man who's willing to go out here and get killed for you. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm your color, but not your kind. Mm -hmm. What you mean? Mm -hmm. We're all the same kind. Mm -hmm. But that was his, my brother said, that was a bad attitude mm -hmm. that he had. Now, that's the senior. Now, Davis, that general was different. Mm -hmm. Benjamin O. Davis Jr., he had a better attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I was interested in the fact that you went into the Navy and uh, you became a frogman or? Well, I sort of fell into that. Okay. Um, after boot camp, they had amphibious training school there at, at uh, Catalina Island. And uh, I guess they decided that since I wasn't going on, they said my first duty was to be on the Coral Sea, USS Coral Sea, big guy car, car. That was too much ship for me. And somehow or another, I, I didn't make it on that ship. And I'm almost glad I didn't. It was just too much for me. I didn't join the Navy. To, that you on a big ship like that, you may as well not leave the land. But I was, I want, I was when they put me in here, and and I that was the first time I saw a black commission uh, marine officer. He was from Atlanta, a little short fella, but he was good at what he did, and he could fight too. Cause I saw him beat two guys out there who didn't want to do right, didn't want to do like they were told, they, because their complexion was different. You know what I'm saying? But he congratulated me. When I graduated, he said he thought he was probably going to have to do me. I told him, I, I saw what you did to the last was I didn't want that. <laughs> you see, he, he pulled his bars off and beat them. They come telling him, say, well, if you didn't have them bars, what they do? He said, don't let them stop. He took them off and beat both of them. And I didn't want that. So yeah, I went right on through that. Yes, sir. And boy, you talking about a guy that knew how to wear a uniform. He was sharp, every day creases in his pants. 
They couldn't have made a better lieutenant in the Marine Corps than that guy. I mean, when it comes to dress, you know, I couldn't keep up. So you went through the training, yeah. and you were then stationed aboard a ship. You found yourself on your way to Korea. How did that work? Well, when I left there, they put me on the USS Dixie, uh, 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 a um, auxiliary destroyer tunnel, as a passenger, not as a member of the crew, to go to Japan. My home port, but not Korea, it was Japan, Yokosuka, Japan. And that was to get on board for the USS Pledge, M277. The picture that I showed you of me on the ship, we were recommissioning that ship. That ship uh, had been built in Alabama in 1943, but it had been decommissioned. And so I went back as a, to work with the crew that they brought in to refurbish it and get it ready. We put a thing on there called an acoustic drum and all. And I'm 17 years old, I'm the baby boy. Everybody's teaching me because I know absolutely nothing. And that was my biggest asset, to know that I knew absolutely nothing. That meant that I could be a sponge and I could learn. And I give those men credit, they took time and they taught me about everything I needed to know. From survival, like I said earlier, many of those men had been in sinkings before. They knew the dangers of being in my, it was called the Suicide Navy, the Mine Squadron. That's why you had your UDT teams and all that connected with them. They are the first responders. So you were a minesweeper. Minesweepers, that's right. We were, when they talk about police and they talk about get a broom and go out there and clean up something. They're not talking go out there and arrest nobody. You go to clean up. We had to clean up, we clean up, we go up. If they spot a mine in the middle of the Pacific, we got to go out there and try to get it anywhere. Well, I was a mine demolition specialist, 17, because of those men. And, they, and I went from $52 a month to $300 a month because of those men. They taught me what I need to know. A ship's diver, you tell them you do that. Tell them you do that. And I told them, that, and they agree. I said, so. And a little, a little extra change looked good in my pocket. So, so you actually had to go underwater to do demolition work? Well, at times you did. But my the thing is, I was a mind demolition special, part of the UDT, part of it. Uh, it's not a Hollywood thing. This is not Hollywood. This is, uh, my job was to run that mine sweeping equipment, those cables and those cutters that we put out there on those paravanes, what they call those Dan buoys and that sort of thing. Then once we sweep, we gotta go back and we gotta put those buoys, make channels so those ships will know what they can come in that had already been swept. Well, my job was to make sure that was done. I worked on, I worked off the fantail until we go to general quarters, then I go to my anti-aircraft gun. That's where we go, I'll go to general quarters. Now, you had mentioned sinkings. Were you ever on a ship that was damaged to the point of um, sinking? Yes, this ship, this ship, my first one, the Pledge, this ship, it sank at 12.36 in the afternoon on October the 12th. Uh, 29 minutes after the USS Pirate, my, uh, our flagship. As a matter of fact, uh, the flag on that ship, uh, Lieutenant Commander Mullins had been Chief Boson mate on the ship I'm on. He taught me, I used to cut his hair. And I wasn't no Bobby, he didn't care. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, there weren't that many mine demolition experts after World War II. So they, they had to take Mullins and make, put him in charge of the squadron. 
he was Command Run 3. I was in Command Run 3. I was one of his ships. I was one of, we were one of his ships. My ship, the Endicott, and a few other sandpans and smaller ships were part of his, his outfit. We were all part of Task Force 77 of the 7th Fleet, of which um, I went across, I became a pilot, I mean, I, I was, I crossed the equator with them. Admiral uh, C. Turner Troy, Admiral C. Turner Joy. I remember he and I were both polywars when we went across. That meant my initiation wasn't so heavy. <laughs> yeah. And I became if a shield. If I understand back. correctly, a polywog was a small frog. Yeah, right, 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 right. A polywog, but you went from a polywog to a shell back okay. once you crossed the equator. Okay. See? So, I, so. so, what was it like to? know that you had to abandon a ship, and I'm assuming that you were a very good swimmer. Well, like I said, I've been a Boy Scout all my life, and I was one of the things that a Boy Scout is be prepared. So I had two life jackets on. I had on a K-Park and a Mae West. I also had, we had two three-inch 50 guns. So I knew that uh, those um, powder casings, they, they would float. And so I preserved me one of those. And like I said, we was at Joan Quarters, and so when they hit, it lifted me out of my gun tub, and it dropped me down to the, on the fantail head up against the ladder there. That's kept me from drowning because my head wasn't in the water. Water was up on the deck. And and I'm dazed. Many of the sailors on there were dazed too. Big explosion and this sort of thing. And then they shooting at you from the, from the beach. Well, I get up and start stirring and I hear, now hear this. This is your captain speaking. This is not a drill. All hands abandon ship. That ain't hard to figure out. That's easy. The man telling you, <coughs> if you ain't planning on going down, you'd better get off. I took him at his word, I, but I, instead of doing it then, I walked up to the bridge. He lost an eye. The lieutenant command, like I said, I'm a day. I see he, he one of his eyes out, and, and lieutenant commander's holding him, our executive officer, not, yeah, his, my uh, chief executive officer hold, and he's, when he was talking, brave men, and had his hat turned backwards, and so I walked on off, and I, one of my buddies was up there. He landed out under one of those 350s. I said, well, the man said abandon ship. And he said, well, go ahead. I, I'll check with you tomorrow. I'll be on over. Well, I guess he got off, I, you know. Mm -hmm. But I got off. And when I got off the ship, the, com the man who was in charge, the commercial officer, he was a lieutenant J.G., and he Somehow or another, he knew me by, he said, Jack, he said, let me have that uh, canister. He said, I can't swim. And I gave it to him. And uh, that evening, about six o'clock, I guess, or seven, it was almost, it wasn't dark, almost getting dark, though. I felt the K-Park getting waterlogged. Mm -hmm. So I took it off, and I hit the button on the Mae West, and it filled it up with the CO2, and it carried me till I got picked up the next day, next morning. So you were in the water overnight. Overnight. Mm-hmm. They, they were right there at breakfast times when they picked me up. Mm -hmm. After they had, eaten. some of them had already eaten some still, and they made a joke of it. The three guys up on the folks. They said, boy, we had to 
pick up steam to catch you. Say you was kicking up a wake eight foot high and your eyes were big as teacups. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't beat that. I laughed with them. They had a boat hook that pulled me on up there, close to it enough for them to throw me a buoy, pull me on in. So then they, re, uh, after a period of time, reassigned you to another ship? Well, they steamed me to the hospital ship okay. to be assessed and evaluated and this sort of thing. And I found out something over there, this hospital ship, they was not just treating sailors, they were treating the army soldiers and everybody. And I saw another soul brother there, he hit. Lost her eye and some stuff, and man, I said, well, I guess you finna go home. He said, no, I got to go back up. I ain't finished my duty. I ain't finished my time. I said, what? <laughs> you, what you gonna do with one eye? <laughs> but that was the army day. I guess he said, he, but he told me that. They didn't, he told me, he said, no, I can't go. He said, I got to go back up there. Got to go back up to the front line. So what was the length of your service in the Navy? How long did you? Stay about on. 30 miles, 30, 36 miles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And were you, once you were discharged from the Navy, um, were you able to use those skills that you had developed in the Navy in civilian life, or did you have to go and be retrained in another area? Well, I was almost unemployable. Um, when I got out, I had to create my own business. Uh, somehow or another, and I was successful at doing it. I mean, I made my own, got I, food, sir. I, I was on, was on the police force there for a while and stuff like that, but, and I was just grown a lot, you know, by the way people were being treated and stuff like that, you know, had friends and all. But I started my own business. It called Betsy's One Stop. I named it after my baby, my youngest daughter. And I'm a copycat. I copied it after David Tom was his name, you know, Wendy's dad, David Thomas. I copied mine after him. And it worked. I worked so good, people thought my name was Mr. Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so this was a restaurant you made well it was fast food you know it, I, it's actually it started out as a filling station and when they telling me I had to buy a million dollar policy for the gas I mailed them the tanks I said no <laughs> I'll put that butt in the bank <laughs> no so now I kept selling that food and I and see, Betsy's mother, she was a chef. She's a good cook. And uh, I had been had been to management school. I went to Wayne State under Dr. Douglas McGregor, the man who wrote uh, Management by Objections, MBO. Yeah. I had that, and I enjoyed education. I still do, but uh, I think we ought to add emancipation to it. I always say consider that education without emancipation was nothing but retardation, you know what I mean? You got to know how, but you don't know how to put it to work. Well, let's follow that line of thinking. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that you served, put your life on the line, you were in the water for almost a whole day. Not, well, well, from from about 12, I'd say from about 12, 15, 12, 20, because the ship went down at 12, 36, and I, would, I, would, I had left then. Mm -hmm. it, it was hit before then, but it sank at 12, 36. And I guess when he called for abandoned ship was maybe five minutes later or something like that, and I got off there. Well, see, the next morning, well, it was just, see, it was overnight, and they were still, they're still firing from the beaches. It's, it's still war out there. And so, but. Uh, but what, what was impressive here is that you did your tour of duty. 
you serve honorably, if you got an honorable discharge, then you go back into the society that you have helped to defend. And this was at a point where we we're beginning to move into the civil rights era. True. And people, I mean, it, it just, how did that feel? Well, <laughs> you know, I was talking about my dad a while ago. And you remember my dad was in World War I. <laughs> and when he came back, my daddy's dog, you saw a picture. They wouldn't let him eat in certain places. He gave my brother. Some place he couldn't go eat. And it wasn't much better when I came back. And uh, you had the white water fountain and the black water fountains and this sort of thing. You know, in other words, it's almost like I went out and defended some people who may have been a little bit retarded. A lot of them didn't need to be mean, you know, you didn't need to be these people needed mental health. Just like, and matter of fact, it's not much different than that today. What I'm getting to, you got to realize any time that, uh, well, I don't want to be political, but anytime you can put a retired in, in the highest office in the world, you something wrong, something somewhere. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're so retired that you don't know how to keep your mouth shut when things ain't bad, something wrong with you. Sometimes the best answer is no answer. So you came back, yeah. and you had to work through all of that. Yes. And you, you seem to indicate that education is the key. Sir? Education is the key. Knowing things is the key. Being able to um, take life experiences and, and create something out of it is the key to, to being able to make it in this society. Well... I mentioned before about the church. I grew up in the church, but one of the most important parts of the Bible to me was the 133rd Psalm and the first Psalm. And I found out that those two Psalms could help the man do what his creator seems to have designed him to do. You see, uh, we get so many answers from that book, but they never, they don't seem to want to understand that the book is designed to do something for the reader. And one of the things it's designed to do is to raise his maturity level. That's the most important thing. So I understand why the Creator made things good, but he put me, you, and everybody else in the biggest room he ever made. He didn't put you in heaven. He didn't put you in the earth. If he did, you'd have been born in the ground. He put you in the biggest room that he ever made, a room big enough for heaven and earth. And that's called the room for further improvement. And because of us being in that room, using the 133rd Psalm, we have been able to improve on everything that God made good. We got light switches now, don't have to wait on the sun. <laughs> huh? Go outdoors and turn the switch on the vehicle. Don't have to wait on a horse, <laughs> crank it up and go. But that's because of that 133rd Psalm. So what would you tell young people coming along now, relative to your experience, what is actually needed in order to make it? First thing, get to know each other. Get to have confidence in each other. You're being exploited by people who want to divide you. See, tell you one thing and tell your friend another. But you and your buddy, your friend, gonna have to agree on something to get something done. Don't be afraid to see what's lacking and see what's causing it to be lacking. Who's causing it to be lacking and let them know that I know you are responsible for this condition that you ought to do something about it. 
If you're not, get out the way so the rest of us can. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we have taught even our grown-ups to not listen to our youth. We talk at them, but we don't talk to them. And we, he got nothing to say. That's because we won't listen. One of the things I like about my rabbi, oh yeah, I got one. Rabbi Yeshua Ben Yusuf. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Do you know him? You call him Jesus, that's the man. See, I call him by a name that if I called it 2,000 years ago, he would answer to because he knew it. He, he knew his name, as you read, yes, you have been useful. He was my rabbi. This man knew if you're going to help anybody with their condition, ask them what's wrong. We go up already knowing, oh, I know what's wrong with you. you blind. You can't see. He went and asked the man, what can I do for you? The man said, I want my eyes, like I might have my sight. But sometimes we're too smart to ask the person, might just want a glass of water. Find out what he want. See what you can do about doing for that first. Then maybe he'll let you do something else for him to make him better. Along those lines then, would you, based upon your experience, life and military, uh, encourage others to go into the military? Yes. In a way. Yes, I would, for the discipline. Mm -hmm. For the discipline, yes, I would. I do it all the time. On my card, you see on there, recruitment officer. Oh, yes. I recruit them for veterans organizations. I recruit them for the military because that's, we need discipline. We need somebody to tell us what to do and have enough sense to do it because it's right to do. So between the Boy Scouts and the military, and you said you were a scout for 30 years. No, 70. 70 years. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is what has brought you through along yes. the path. That's yes, somewhere. true. Okay. That and um, those men who took time and raised me at 20, 53, men who decided that I had shown enough proficiency in 1972 to invite me into the consistory? Yes. For posterity, is there anything that you would like to say that would be informative and uh, enlightening for those that would, in the future, that would sit and listen to this tape and your experiences? Well, I'd, what I would like to say, I would like to say thank you. You've been a good interviewer. Thank Dr. Tate. She's not only good at what she do, she's good looking too. <laughs> and um, of course, Manara, Miss Gaston. Mm -hmm. And I hope that there's something I said will be beneficial to somebody. Uh, there are heroes all over the place. My mother was a hero. We must not forget uh, many of the questions that you asked me were about the domestic situation. Those heroes that fought the domestic war for us. Dr. King, mm -hmm. John Lewis, H. Rep. Brown, <laughs> Stokely, and above all, El Haj Malik, El Shabazz, Malcolm X. And one of the most intelligent men of our times, we must not forget him, a man that didn't really have a third grade education but seemed to have done more than many of those people put together, and that is Elijah Poo. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man that took so little and did so much. <laughs> yeah. we don't, many of us forget that, uh, that this man had less, I heard, than a third grade education. But he was aware 
that whoever control the food supply control the creature. And for him and his people, they work hard to control their own food supply. They don't wait for the lamb to be shipped. They don't mind raising it in the field. <laughs> I've noticed that you brought some materials with you. Would you like to share them? Oh. Um, some of the things that you have here. Okay. This seems to be a picture of your parents. Yeah. We would like to, for you to hold it up. Okay. This, your parents. Yeah. And their names again? Mm-hmm. Their tell, name. Tell us their names. Hmm? The name, your parents' name. Oh, this is my daddy, James Arthur Lucas, and this is my mother, Lula. And I noticed that you had an article about the... Yeah, a little sweet, clear way for big ships. Hold that up so that we can... Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. There's my picture there. Mm -hmm. As a member of that crew, we are recommissioning that ship. Can you, are you in that picture? Can you point out where you are in there? No, we cannot see where he is. Uh, he's in the yeah. white, white head in the front. Right here. Oh. No, but you want this one. This is another part of that picture. That's I mean on the end here, but he, this is the picture right here of me. Turn it around. This is the certificate that uh, Barack Obama had sent to me. Leon Panetta uh, was the Secretary of Defense. And I have uh, another one here from the state of North Carolina where they eventually got around to saying hello. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. They said hello and thank Finally you. Finally got around to saying hello. You know, they didn't give me a bonus uh, when I got out of the military. They didn't give anybody one uh, from the Korean War. Uh, their excuse was that uh, they were using our bonuses to build the railroads, I mean, to build the highway, which is okay. I ride on the highway. But I noticed other states built highways and gave the veterans a bonus. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't ask them who was spending my bonus, but I knew it wasn't me. That's okay. <laughs> well, again, we thank you for. And I have a couple of questions. Oh, please do. Uh, so, Mr. Lucas, in, in the interview, um, we, we heard a lot of uh, the male side of the story. But I'd love to know about how you met your wife, how you, your children came along. Okay, well, interesting enough, I've had more than one wife. Uh, I don't know if I was just too ugly to keep one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I never, all of them were good. And uh, I think most of them met me. Uh, and Minnie, Jamelia's mother, she and I went to school together. And what was her name? Minnie Haley Lucas. Uh, and so went to high school or? We went to grade school. To grade school? Yeah, we grew up together. Uh, she had been married before, too, before she married me, and I had to, uh, what you call that, uh, we just sort of drifted back. Um, and Clara, I didn't have any children by Clara as my last wife. She died. And, in 2014, July the 4th, uh, 2014. And Betsy's mother, we weren't really married. She's from West Virginia. She'd been married before, but her husband was killed in Korea. 
Uh, Henrietta, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, streetwise enough for Henrietta. That was the first one. She, I was paid to marry her by her daddy. And, and she work? ran off with the money. I had to chase her to get my money. <laughs> Uh, and, but people or not, when I called with a shit man, another guy named Jack. <laughs> Which was okay, you know. Um, it was no love lost, just a few dollars. Once I got my money, we was all straightened out again. I remember I went to get the money. Her husband had it all lined out on a coffee table. And uh, he was ballet dancer. They, they could use dope. I said, I didn't use dope. They, they, they did dope. And probably other things too, whatever. But, but they was from Ohio, Cleveland, grew up together. I'm from South, you know, North Carolina. A lot of things they did, I couldn't, I couldn't hang. Well, I was paranoid, still am. I'm responsibly paranoid. Uh, I'm a what's called behavior science chemist. I put everything and everybody under the microscope, including me. <laughs> That's why you live so long. I'd like to believe that too. I hope you're right. So, um, love stories or any? Love stories? <laughs> Love yeah, I love stories. You got one I want to tell you? Um, I'm not that much of a lover. Um, I've been told I'm a little bit too serious about things. I mean, I take some things lightly that I think I can, but um, I'm, when I look in the mirror, I use this regularly. Sounds a bit vain. I see the best looking thing I'm gonna see all day. So I ain't running nothing down to hurt. See what I'm saying? If you see anything better than me, go get it. Cause I ain't after it. <laughs> I'll be here if or when you get back. But I won't be chasing you to find out what, what, what you chasing. I don't chase fire trucks. <laughs> I can't do nothing with them. So that's when I see love stories, I see tragedy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I see tragedy. I think that's why many people like love stories. They want to help, you know, they say, that's where the blues, I think, come out of love stories. Feel so bad. Feel like a ball game on a rainy day and stuff. <laughs> and I just want to go back a little bit in the interview for a couple of questions that I had. Okay. Around your parents' occupation. Yeah. To be clear. They were farmers? No, no, no. Or they worked at tobacco factories. At, at yeah, cigarette factories. Mm -hmm. I was in around tobacco car. Do you have recollections of how it was for them as African Americans working there? Oh, that's what they built that home. Mm -hmm. and them African Americans, matter of fact, you had them excursions go to South Carolina, bring it. <laughs> didn't have enough, uh, what you call them? Didn't, they had brought them up in boxcars. <laughs> yes, sir. And they would see they were escaping the farm to get that to rentals. You see, a lot of them would start building homes and houses. We even had a little section of Winston Salem called Reynolds Town. You know, they got them a little prestige working for Reynolds because you, he fixed where you can buy a house. You know, yeah, you know, you can start you, you know, take your rent and buy your house. Uh -huh. So you were kind of considered middle class. Hmm? Was, was your family? considered middle class within the African-American community? Well, like I said, I uh, remember that we talk about a s separate and unequal situation here. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, 
just because I'm doing better than my neighbor don't mean that I'm doing real good. It just meant that I'm a little bit better manager of nothing. That's all. He's mismanaging nothing. I'm just a little bit better manager of it. And because my mother was considered something of a little loan shark, she taught us early. She said, uh, Jack, if you only made a quarter, you could, own, you could save a nickel. And I questioned on it, and then she explained it to me, and I understood that, and I learned to live by it, and it kept me out the garbage can a time or two. Because she said, all you got to do is live like you only made 20 cents. But some of us, she seemed to make a quarter and want to live like you made 50, 50 cents, and you always a quarter in the hole every week. So I've learned that, how to be a bit frugal, manage your resources. And to those who don't do it, you would look like you're middle third or upper class. Yeah, for those that don't. But uh, I like management. I think that's what emancipation is all about, management. And one last fill-in-the-blank question. You mentioned uh, while you were in the race in this, this issue of um, colorism, of light, mm -hmm. light skin versus dark skin. Not versus, just... Uh, they, but yeah, okay, I I'll accept that. But it was just you said that there was a name. They there was did they give you a name for it or? Well, they were not very complimentary. Oh. Those who were using it, matter of fact, uh, the white ones would call you a breed or something like that. But there, it's always something to try to make you feel. Uh, guilty or uh, that you were getting some kind of uh, favor that they would have got if, if it wasn't for your complexion or this sort of thing. But uh, it didn't bother me that much because, like I said, I've always been the benefit of somebody else's investment and I've had to protect that all my life. I, I didn't want to go home and make my mother and my father shame. They done got up and worked every day and come home and shared part of what they earned with me. And then I took it like it wasn't nothing, just throw it away. I, I didn't know how to tell them I took your thing and threw it away. I want them to say, you know, I made a good choice in handing it to Jack and he really did something with it. And that's what I done. And I guess the last uh, question, you have been honored for your years of service. Is there any um, particular honor that stands out more mm -hmm. than other? Is there an honor that you've received since, as I say, now that we're I suppose when I became, I was really never honored until after Obama got in. See, most of what I'm telling you happened when Harry Truman was in there. This was in 1950. Uh, and they tried to discourage any kind of thing on the part of non Caucasians or black folk. Matter of fact, um, when many people, I tell them I was in the Navy, they suggested that I was just some kind of service animal, shining shoes or cook or this sort of thing. When I tell them that I was on a ship, got sunk, they want to know, were you there? No. <laughs> uh, they presume that if you are uh, black, uh, that you sneaky fella, you slippery, you, you know how to get through the cracks, you know what I'm saying? When I tell them, no, we're not all like that. I said, so we are warriors. We're about that. I said, Man, many blacks do not understand that blacks were in this country 1,500 years before Christopher Columbus hit, hit Puerto Rico. Blacks came over here after the fall of Carthage. You know that. Matter of fact, those, you hear them call those women your warriors, Amazons. Some of those women came out of England with those Africans over here 
That's why they call them Amazons. They found them on the Amazon River. They didn't find them in Greece. <laughs> That's right. They were Celtic. They were Celtic women. Celtic warriors who came over here with him because they were, see, they was fighting in England between the, the Okay. That's what it is. That's, that's what I'm saying. We, when we don't, there's a man named, his, he's been dead a while. You ever heard of France Fanon? Okay. Well, I'm going to quote something he said. The study of history rewards all research. Because he wrote other things. He wrote Wretched of the Earth and Black mass and white face. So, he's from Algeria. He was from Algeria. So was Sam Lucas. He was born in Algeria. <laughs> That's dad is there, my granddaddy. He was born in Algeria. Okay. So you know some of your genealogy? Hmm? Some of your family genealogy? So your dad's? Well, Daddy said he went over there when he was, you know, he fought in, my daddy fought in Europe. They went through Africa, so he they went through Algeria. And he was ugly enough to favor his daddy that they they recognized him. <laughs> and was your mother a native of mm -hmm. North Carolina? I'm from, what was that? Your mother. No. My parents were born in South Carolina, both of them. Daddy was born in Lockhart, and Mama was born, I think, in Lockhart or Santo. Right there. Mm -hmm. Very functional. I, I, I'm proud of my, based on what I've seen, I wouldn't have traded them for millionaires or anything. I had the best that there is to offer. I, I, I really did, I'm, I'm family wise. Very functional family. Well, one thing, uh, we had a lot of respect for each other. And they wanted to know what you did today. How'd you do? You got the money. Where'd you get it? You ain't stealing, right? You know, they'd ask you. They knew how to, my parents knew how to ask you questions. And they expected you to know how to answer them. And there was nothing we couldn't ask in our house. We were taught the only dumb question is the one you didn't ask. <laughs> Say mother wit. Mm -hmm. Say, you know. Mother wit and learning, you know, learning. No, my mother could have taught school. Mm. My dad didn't, he didn't finish the seventh grade or something like that, but they worked together like a team. He'd bring that money to the house. I hear him say, well, Lulu, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this, this American Legion convention coming up in, in Asheville and so on and so And I remember her answer, you, oh, don't worry, Arthur, you'll be ready. Because she's going to have that money. That's all you're talking about. You're going to have that. And what, if it take money, that's all it takes is money. You ain't going to You'll be there. And I guess I, we all in our family picked up some of that. I remember going home one day telling her, I said, you know, money ain't everything. She said, it ain't. I said, no. She said, tell me what money ain't that you want. <laughs> I wasn't her. Just stopped just like, what is money? What is it that money ain't that you want? Everything you want called money. It ain't everything, but tell me what it ain't that you want. Couldn't do nothing with them. But thank them. I thank them every day for being my parents. 
Well, that's great. I thank you for sharing those that wonderful thought and experience. Well, Got thank me smiling. You. So your parents did a good job. If I could tell them, I'd let them know. Oh, <laughs> I say if your parents did a great job. I'd let them know if I if I if I could. Well, uh, when you say it, they hear it. Um, my parents never died. You're still here. Hmm? They're hearing you. No, as long as we can remember them, they're with us. And uh, just about every day, I have something I can laugh about that they had already warned me about. Uh, it's like these little sayings I'm sharing with you. And I enjoy that. Yes, sir. Uh, well, just to wrap up, I see you with well decorated. Is there any? Well, um, you share with? when I was commander of the American Legion, they expected you to come decorated. Believe it or not, this medal here is Sempaparatus. Tell me what that means. Uh, Tell me what that means. Always prepared. No. Um, uh, let's revisit just a little bit the um, sinking of the ship. Uh, how many survivors? Um, I think it's some, they say it was nine lost, nine of them. But the way that they counted casualties when I was in the military was if you could walk, you weren't considered a casualty. I think I was telling you about the young man that I saw on the yeah, I was shot in the head. He could walk. He wasn't a casualty. He going back up there. I think they call it going back for seconds. Did they get it the first time? So, um, you were one of nine survivors? Or no, no, no. Sorry. No, no, it was more than that. She, she took one. It took them. I think the ship had about 50 member crew. So you figure nine from 50 or something like that. Or 42, because we weren't, we may have been at full battle strength when we were in there, I'm not sure. But I know we lost at least nine men. Nine casualties. Everybody that was in the engine room were gone. We thank you again not only for your service, but for an excellent interview, very informative, very inspiring, and um, I'm certain anyone in the future who should chance upon this interview and your recollection of your experiences will feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thank you for making it easy for me. I know that wasn't easy to make it easy for me, but you did, and thank you anyway. Thank you for it. And you're doing an excellent job.